Thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers. And now beyond the general um, Latin American title, uh, there is more specificity. And the uh, new title is Baroque Spectacle in La Ultima Plena Que Bailó Luversa, which will be uh, Luversa's last dance by Manuel Ramos Otero and Expressionist Grambling and Eva Perón by Copi. So I'm going to uh, discuss these two texts today, but my main focus uh, will be on Blue Bersa's Last Dance. And I will also share some ideas as to my approach to Copi's Eva Perón, as well as some comments on how these uh, two texts fit together. Um, in the first case, we're dealing with a Baroque literary style that, that is employed to tell the story, while the second benefits from the influences of Expressionism. In both cases, I will consider how aesthetic choices play an important role in creating innovative texts where the meaning of simple plot narratives is expanded by the mode of representation. While the aesthetic choices shape key aspects of the narrative from character development to plot and tone, the style does not eclipse the dialogue that they establish with socio-political themes. Baroque spectacle and the striking portrayals of expressionism situate both texts alongside specific moments and discourses in literary history. However, these modes of expression are appropriated to speak to contemporary readers about issues that are still current in the case of Luversa's Last Dance, the struggle to maintain a Puerto Rican identity distinct from that of the United States in the face of American domination through Commonwealth status, and in the case of Eva Perón, to underscore abuses of power and the complex contradictions of Argentina. Indeed, there are commonalities both texts between both texts. To begin with, they are both biographical and focus on women who are well known within their respective nations. In the case of Eva Perón, fame transcends the borders of Argentina. And in the case of Luberza Oppenheimer, she's nonetheless a well-known figure in Puerto Rican popular culture. Similarly, and this will require further explanation, there, um, or exploration, I should say, there are commonalities between uh, both aesthetic movements, as Walter Benjamin points to a strong link between the Baroque and Expressionism in their use of language. And this offers a good starting point for discussions where the analysis of one movement may illuminate specific aspects and functions of the other. Better understanding on their connection may also explain why these particular modes of representation were selected to tell the stories of these historical figures and relationship between the aesthetic choice and the politics it embraces. But first, let me speak to the Baroque in Latin America. While it is common knowledge that Spain transferred many elements of its culture to Hispanic America during the colonial period, it is perhaps less obvious that much of the superimposition of culture involved the expansion of the Baroque in the region. The complexity of forms, ornateness, abundance of references, and overall extravagance witnessed in the historical Baroque period in Europe found its expression on American soil. This, for example, did not occur in the American territories under English rule, where the aesthetic export was essentially of the neoclassical sort, barring what we just heard. There might be some Baroque expression, but in general not. Therefore, the simplicity and general distaste for extravagance, which has largely defined the culture of the United States, had its origins in English influences over this territory, where neoclassicism reigned. So if Octavio Paz's dictum that historical differences between the United States and Mexico uh, represent two distinct versions of Western civilization, if that holds true, this is largely due to the extensive influence of the Baroque in Mexico and the region and the absence of it north of the Rio Grande. This difference is evident in cultural representations of all types, 
but may be readily appreciated, for example, in painting. And we have a Cuban painting on the left and a, Jacob, a series from the Jacob Lawrence migration. Jumping forward to the 20th century, Baroque influences still stand strong. Indeed, criticism key to understanding the Baroque hails from Cuba during the period in essays by Jose Lezama Lima, Alejo Carpentier. Carpentier perceives the Baroque as a universal cultural expression, one that is not restricted to specific places and times. In Latin America, he sees this uh, indigenous Baroque expression. So um, while the Baroque is linked to colonial conquest, it is embraced in Latin American societies as a movement that allows for the inclusion of non-European influences. Uh, moreover, cultural factors, um, beyond cultural factors, Carpentier sees Latin America's topography and climate, its great rivers and mountains, earthquakes and hurricanes, as playing a role in these cultural expressions of abundance and excess. Lesama Lima, a Cuban critic as well, also makes a connection between Baroque aesthetics and hybridity as he signals the Baroque's ability to synthesize indigenous African and Spanish cultures. He underscores the unifying force of the Baroque in the Americas as he shares a holistic vision of its material and immaterial representations. His list includes the expansion of linguistic codes, mysticism that shapes religious practices, the presence of home furnishings, the taste for and consumption of fine foods, as well as forms of life and curiosities. In other words, Lesama underscores the pervasive influence of the Baroque on the Latin American experience. It should therefore not surprise us to see a resurgence of Baroque writing in the 20th century as authors continue to represent their societies and explore issues regarding identity with an aesthetic that effectively represents the complexities of the region. So the theories obviously coexisted with Baroque narratives as evidenced in the novels of Carpentier, Lesama, Severo Sardui, and others. In the specific case of Puerto Rico, it is important to mention that the island, like the Hispanic Caribbean in general, does not feature the extravagant Baroque constructions, for example, that one finds in Mexico or Peru. However, there is a, a Baroque architecture on the island, and with the solid linguistic bridge that Spanish affords, Puerto Ricans had been aware of the ideas circulating in the Hispanic world, including the Cuban discourse on this subject. And for example, Luis Rafael Sanchez, an important voice in Puerto Rican letters, writes on Carpentier, and his own texts have been described as, as containing Baroque elements. Moreover, the, islands, uh, the island nation's hybridity, the excessive forces of nature that it is subject to are clearly conditions that Carpentier had mentioned. Uh, as linked to Baroque expression. So to be clear, the similar similarities between Puerto Rico and the rest of Latin America are many. However, the United States domination of the island starting in 1898 places it in a unique situation, one that Ramos Otero uh, addresses. So Manuel Ramos Otero uh, wrote essentially short uh, stories, poetry, and essays, mostly in the 1970s and 80s. His work was often controversial because of its sexual and political content. He writes from the perspective of a Puerto Rican gay man in exile in New York, and the theme of marginalization often appears in his texts. Luberza's Last Dance was first published in a literary journal alongside a story by Rosario Ferre, uh, a well-known Puerto Rican novelist, that is also based on the life of Luberza Oppenheimer. Ramos Otero's story was later included in an anthology, El Cuento de la Mujer del Mar, The Stories of the Woman of the Sea, um, a collection published in 1979. The text has not been published in English, and the translations you will see today are mine. 
Um, his untimely death in 1990 due to complications from AIDS cut short the contributions of a powerful Latin American voice. Luberza's last dance appeared during a period of much independentista political activity, meaning independence from the United States, in Puerto Rico in the 1970s. The short story describes the final days of Isabel Luberza Oppenheimer, popularly known as Isabel La Negra, Black Isabel, the owner of a successful brothel house of prostitution in Ponce, the island's second largest city. In this text, the reader accompanies Frau Luberza, the character's name, in, um, in the story on her last day. The plot may be quickly summed up. Frau Luberza feels death close by and uh, wishes to secure her place in heaven. She visits a Monsignor at church to pay for it. She also pays a last visit to a psychic and roams the halls of her, bra of her bordello, all of this leading up to the final scene where she's shot to death. So that's essentially the linear narrative that would be. The story is organized in a temporal fashion with each section's title corresponding with an exact hour. The narrative begins at 6.13 a.m. as Frau Luberza is escorted in her long black limousine, checkbook in hand, to convince the Monsignor to accept payment in exchange for a spot in heaven. From the beginning, the reader evidences Baroque expression as language and structure highlight the aesthetic choice. The first sentence, for example, is communicated in parts as asides come between its various sections. I have come to buy the kingdom of heaven for when I die, she says. This introduces her first person narrative as she starts on her mission. It is followed by a descriptive narrative that includes a lengthy survey of her body, its movements, her clothes, and specific accessories. Therefore, at the beginning of the story, we have I have come to buy the kingdom of heaven for when I die. And, we and he includes these constant interruptions, these spirals. With her right leg crossed over her left leg, Frau Luberza's leg behind her stockings net with stitchings that displays lilies and lotus flowers in mourning, twisting around from her heel and rising up her softly curved calf. With her left hand, she lets her shoe dangle, liberating her deformed foot with pointy bones. Her hand returns and unfastens the golden buttons on her black draped silk purse, and her sharp fingers like knives piercing through invisible stitches in the wind. She clasps her suede checkbook between two owl liver red nails. Frau Luberza goes on saying, Protect me, Saint Lucretia, from all harm while her gold pen is sketching figures on paper. The formal complexity, the attention to detail, the repetition and enumeration exemplify Baroque aesthetics. The reader is invited to gaze as descriptive language creates a multiplicity of images. These include the very air around Frau Luberza as she cuts through it with knife-like fingers. The stitches in the wind make the invisible visible in keeping with the Baroque representations penchant for display. This narrative strategy, strategy holds true throughout the story. So for example, the first sentence is much longer than the fragment we have just reviewed. If one does not include the descriptive passages in parentheses, one sees the first sentence with greater clarity, and part of it reads. So this is only part of the first sentence that has been interrupted multiple times. Part of it reads, I have come to buy the kingdom of heaven for when I die, and Monsignor will tell me if the price for the kingdom of heaven has increased since our last conversation at the sacristy. And Monsignor should know that this will be my last offer to buy the kingdom of heaven. I've placed asterisks both in the original and in the translation where the first person narrative is complemented, if not interrupted, by the inclusion of the descriptive passages 
And I'm only sharing a portion of a much larger sentence that would be like the, the equivalent of the first cha uh, section of this short story. The structure will hold true throughout. And even in sections where this does not take place, there are detailed descriptions, language that is highly visual and complex in its form, and writing where excess is evident as repetition and attention to minor details take center stage. The linear gives way to the elliptical. Indeed, the narrative spotlights objects whose importance is enhanced by emphasizing their presence. This underscoring invites the reader to extrapolate as the descriptions office often focus on parts of a whole. For example, Flauru Bersa's stockings or the short and fat fingers on the Monsignor's hands. While this writerly Baroque surely dazzles the reader as to its multiple functions, or clarity as to its multiple functions, does begin to emerge. First of all, it is evident that language is one of the main protagonists. The unifying force, despite any impression one may have of dispersion. In this text, language shaped by Baroque aesthetics is at the center and its centrifugal force affects all elements of the story from a plot whose simplicity frames the excesses of language to character development intrinsically defined by excess. So the reader is invited to participate in a celebration of language, specifically the Spanish language. And given Puerto Rico's history, this may be read as a political statement of resistance against the efforts of the United States to eradicate the language in the Commonwealth. Hybridity is embraced with references to Afro-Caribbean religions standing alongside Catholic beliefs interspersed throughout the text. Again, complex descriptions. Always, even though an Afro-Caribbean aesthetic, something reminiscent of that splendor of Baroque spectacle. Um, Frau, Lu uh, Frau Luberza attempts, after all, to persuade a Catholic monsignor and also wishes to ensure the protection of specific African deities, a reference to their presence, omnipresence in uh, the Hispanic Caribbean. So where does this all lead us? The Baroque aesthetics serve to elevate Luberza Oppenheimer, to underscore her existence and position her beyond what collective memory relates. Indeed, Luberza is well known in Puerto Rico and the popular narrative evokes images of violence and ostracism as she was killed by gunfire, and the Catholic Church did not wish to conduct her funeral service. Resituating the historic figure as Frau Luberza in a Baroque literary text with its swirl of references subverts, if not obscures, simplistic narratives of her life. One could argue that Luberza's last dance aspires to endow the historical persona with mythical qualities as Frau Luberz has described as someone who sees and hears everything, a sort of supernatural madam. Yet this characterization is also the tale of a woman who wants redemption and seeks a space that will dignify her existence. So the story may also be read as allegory, one of Puerto Rico's political and cultural erasure within the United States as the text resists the effects of domination. Ramos Otero sees the aesthetics of the Baroque as accomplices in the struggle against the disparaging forces waged on Puerto Rico's people and culture as he claims a space for his discourse. In addressing these matters, Luberza Oppenheimer's story transcends the narrative of an individual experience to represent all marginalized subjects as well as na national anxieties and desires. And now let's move on to Eva Perón and expressionist representation. Uh, Daniel uh, Raúl da Monte Botana was otherwise known as Copi. Most people know him as Copi. Uh, an Argentine writer, cartoonist, and playwright. His, his father was an anti-Peronist politician and director of the journal Tribuna Popular. A political repression under Perón forced the family into exile, and Copi finally settled in Paris, um, where he collaborated with the avant-garde group Panico, 
along with Fernando Arrabal. So in many ways, what Copi does with the historical figure of Eva Perón is the opposite of what Ramos Otero does. Copi employs what I see as expressionist elements to demythologize the figure of Eva Perón. His play subverts all attempts to portray her as a heroic figure. Indeed, the Argentine former first lady um, had inspired both positive and negative portrayals since the earliest appearances of cultural depictions on her life. So for example, as early as 1952, um, the, Wim, the Woman with the Whip by Mary Main was the first critical biography on her life. However, her, her early death, beauty, her Robin Hood populist politics resulted in a series of larger than life, essentially affirmative portrayals. So Kobe's text is a one act play with five characters, Avida, her mother, Ibiza, her assistant, a nurse, and Peron. The plot, once again, is very simple. Ava argues with her mother and assistant as she looks for what she describes as her presidential dress. The first word out of her mouth is shit, and this sets the tone for vulgar dialogue throughout, which includes direct references to her cancer, complaints about her husband, and exchanges about her unwillingness to have anyone inherit her wealth. It concludes with Ibiza and Evita stabbing, uh, the nurse and dressing her corpse up as Evita. Evita in turn disguises herself as the nurse and makes her exit. Peron is then seen giving, giving a political speech slash eulogy at Evita's funeral and the somber tone of his address contrasts sharply with grotesque antics leading up to, the mo to this moment. So official discourse is juxtaposed to a horrific version, uh, the last moments of uh, uh, Evita's life. Now, while the dramatic action magnifies well-known aspects of her life, the main focus is Eva's, Evita's inner emotional state, as filtered through Kopi's uh, perception and modes of performance. So, for example, the role of Evita was played by a transvestite when it first opened in Paris, a transgender performance like others staged by Kopi. Therefore, he not only refutes commonly accepted narratives, regarding Evita's life, but also questions the essentialism of gender. If the staging approaches the carnivalesque, it is important to recall that the masks may be helpful in revealing unexplored aspects of Evita's life. Her fans clearly did not like this, and the theater where the play was first performed was bombed. Throughout the play, Kopi alludes to the performative aspects of Evita's life through meta-theater and the reader-spectator cannot distinguish the line between reality and fiction, and this is in keeping with Ava Perone's biography, where as an actress she worked on radio and television, and her rise to political fame also included well-orchestrated role play. However, Kopi is not interested in representing a biograph biographical narrative. Mm, it, truthfulness and accuracy have nothing to do with this, but rather in painting her emotional reality with broad, bold strokes. Emotions are intensified with language that reveals anger and disgust, and when the dialogue refers to her diseased body, one cannot help but think that it is also describing her soul. Yet nothing is definitive in this portrayal. The play questions whether she really had cancer or if the disease was simply a final performance. I'm going to jump forward and just share a little bit of dialogue to get that expressionist rambling I call it. It has nothing to do with moving forward a linear narrative, but just complaints about her husband, complaints about. So this is just one scene where she's blaming Peron for her death. Um, Peron wants to poison me. He put poison in the injections. Coward, leave me alone. You are his accomplices. That's what caused my cancer. I always knew it. They wanted to operate on the cancer in my uterus, the cancer in my throat, the cancer in my hair, the cancer in my brain, the cancer of my ass, because I shit on his government. So essentially, um, what we have here is a subversion of any possible positive portrayals. Her focus on her inner state, her emotions, is linked to her sick body. And um, it presents the complexity of, of the character, the presence of a double, but let's not forget that the nurse becomes the dead Evita, and the contradictions of Argentina. And this creates an allegory, once again, of the, for the nation as a place to be understood with a grotesque representation. Thank you very much.